talk today is about how to become a warrior for social justice. Um, I'm going to take you on a brief journey to a southern, southern country in, in Africa. It's uh, the country of Zimbabwe. It's a beautiful place, nestled between the Zambezi and the Limpopo rivers. Today, imagine we're arriving in Zimbabwe. The temperature is a hot, dusty 110 degrees. The Republic of Zimbabwe, which is officially is known as the Republic of Zimbabwe, uh, the population is roughly about 14 million people. The country was once a shining example of success in Africa. Zimbabwe has been run by dictator Robert Mugabe for over 30 years, um, a highly educated man, uh, Mugabe started out as a freedom fighter like Nelson Mandela. When Mugabe came to power, there was a lot of excitement and hope that things would change. But hope didn't last. Today, Zimbabwe's economy remains in deep crisis. Poverty, unemployment, and repression are everywhere. OK, so we're walking the streets of Harare now. We pass a young girl, an elderly man, a woman, each selling basic foods, tomatoes, bananas, bread. These vendors put their life at risk. They face angry shopkeepers, police seizures of goods, rape, torture, and even death. Each of these vendors has a story to tell, whether it's to keep their family fed or their sisters from being sold to a Chinese businessman, they do this because they have no choice. So you have come with me on this journey to document the rape of young girls. In Zimbabwe, um, these girls are raped, some gang raped. Men are counseled in Zimbabwe um, through their traditional healers, which are much like our Western doctors, that if they rape a virgin and they mix their blood with the purity of a virgin blood, they will cure themselves of AIDS. While confronting the traditional healers of Zimbabwe, my assistant and I were arrested, put in a co-ed overcrowded prison without food or water. Later, I learned that this was one of Mugabe's torture centers, complete with sulfuric acid on the bottom floor to dispose of human bodies. The US Embassy told me that we must get out over the weekend or we'd be, we would be raped or killed. Um, that's a long, long story and one I won't share today. Um, but we escaped not only with our lives, but also the film of the atrocities happening there. We escaped, believe it or not, um, through the calm, methodical thinking of my husband, a Facebook connection, and a CIA agent. What I want to do today is talk about all the ways in, in which you might choose to open your eyes to the many social injustices happening around you, specifically within the United States of America, California, and locally. Social justice in includes every person and means access to basic necessities like shelter, food, water, um, an environment free from violence or reprisal, and the very essence of social justice, which is human dignity. So I'm going to take on another journey. Um, imagine a place where the sun shines 330 days out of the year. A town centrally located, 30 minutes from the rugged and beautiful Pacific Ocean, nestled in the epicenter of global technology, and surrounded by some of the richest communities. You may recognize some of these. Let's see if I can hobble up there. So you've got Menlo Park, Atherton, Portola Valley, Woodside, you can see, and right over on the other side, there's a little town called East Palo Alto. Raise your hand if you've ever been on the ground in East Palo Alto. OK, if that means going to IKEA, put your hand down. <laughs> and on the ground means not in a car. All right, so good. OK. Um, for me, from my house, it's roughly about six miles. And it's two and a half miles of the most profound poverty and hopelessness. Um, let me give you some brief facts about East Palo Alto. Late 1990s, EPA had the highest homicide rate in the United States. Residents faced higher chronic disease, lower life expectancy, 
all because of what they experience on a day-to-day -day level. Spend a day with me at Stanford Emergency and you will see broken and shattered lives. Um, some sent home because they lacked any kind of health insurance. Wow, think about that. So how many places like East Palo Alto exist in our country? And I ask you, is this social justice? Girls to Women is the organization that I mentioned that Pat runs. It's designed, it's a small group in East Palo Alto it's designed to help low-income, single-parent immigrant families um, with after-school support and summer support. Imagine trying to keep this nonprofit going amidst what seems like an, like an ocean of poverty, drugs, and guns. And I, and I bring up another thing, another issue here is sometimes when we try to help, we get unintended consequences. Um, recently, a Silicon Valley company donated, I think, five or six computers to Girls to Women, and believe me, Pat was thrilled. But when you think about it, their environment isn't safe, so they couldn't lock those computers up anywhere. And so these, their staffers had to take them home, which put their personal life at risk because they were, you know, if they came across someone who wanted the computer, um, they had to make a choice. And Pat would always say to her staff, give up the computer, it's not worth your life. But think about those choices they have to make every day. The nonprofit doesn't even have a telephone line. There's a little emergency, I think it's a yellow phone on the wall um, that you, you can call 911. It can only, that's the only thing it will call. But imagine if you worked in East Palo Alto. Wouldn't you want to have a phone in case of emergencies? So I want to talk next about portrayal of women. Um, women in the audience, I want you to think about this. How are you portrayed in the media, in content? You know, take a look at Jennifer Newsom's Misrepresentation. It's a terrific documentary that talks about how women are portrayed as sex objects. But worse than that constant portrayal is we collude. We buy into that view. Yes, my life, my passion, uh, turned me into a warrior for social justice. And how I came to this work was from having to have, get a firm grip on what happened to me in my own life and the own, in my own injustices as a child. I too, like those street vendors, had no choice. I was a victim of abuse, assault, and incest as a child. I know what it's like to be surrounded by fog and confusion, and shattered and not understanding what happened, but you know, certain that it was all my fault. I knew what it was like as a human being to feel like nothing. I was also fed a steady diet of movies and television that reinforced my inferior status as a girl child. I also went to 12 years of private Catholic school that taught me to be selfless and allowed me to believe that there was no place for women in leadership. That reinforced my feelings of unworthiness. Chief Financial Officer of Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, in her new book, Lean In, said that sometimes, and she spoke of women here, that you have to lean in and demand what you're worth. But what about the rest of us who were engulfed in a world that reinforced our lack of worth? My self-worth was damaged as a child. Not because I wasn't loved. In fact, I was surrounded by love. I am an example. Hmm. I am an example of the objectification of women that we see everywhere. So it wasn't about the people I loved wanting to hurt me. It was about um, never having to say no to their own impulses. Very different than love. So. I carried that worth into business, into the business world, and I allowed myself to sit at a table negotiating multi-million dollar deals on behalf of Nike uh, for athletes such as Ronaldo and Tiger Woods. I put together the Tiger Woods Electronic Arts um, video game franchise that today is conservatively worth about $600, $700 million. Do you think that I thought myself worthy enough to take a percentage of what I created? Worse, on the eve of that deal, pregnant, it was a holiday, uh, was just about to be announced to the media, 
I got a call over to Electronic Arts by a new executive who I had never met before. His first words to me were, why the heck were you in our video, in our press release? Um, in that moment, what Sheryl Sandberg talks about again is giving yourself a seat at the table. I sat at that table. In fact, I brought every deal to that table for our review. And truth is, despite my role, and in terms of my own self-worth, I hadn't even let myself into the parking lot. It's pretty frightening that Grand Theft Auto V made a billion dollars within three days. One billion dollars, it's a significant part of that game glamorizes violence towards women and to others. And is that social justice? To me, social justice is forcing the creators of that game to take a percentage of profits to offset, offset the damage. It's probably not going to be very popular. If you still want to play those games, go to East Palo Alto, where this, you know, this violence, where violence and death are happening in real time every day. And trust me, there's no glamour to it. Ask a family who's just buried a son or a daughter what they think about our society's definition of manhood. Bohemian Club. The Bohemian Club, how many of you know the Bohemian Club? Okay, great. Um, very popular, uh, prestigious Bay Area organization uh, for men only. When I asked one of my dearest male friends, who I actually think is one of the smartest men I know, um, why women are not allowed, he said this. Women interrupt our concentration. We get sidetracked. Women's presence deflects attention from the reason we are there. Really? Think about this. Why this should matter to you is these are global leaders, artists, CEOs who sit around the campfire and shape the future of our planet. And they see women as a distraction. Look around you, a world run only by men. How's that working for you? Consider this. Do you know the Super Bowl is the largest sexually trafficked event in America? These are not slimy pedophiles that wait to prey on your young daughter. And, in this case, young sons. These are athletes and fathers and brothers and cousins who have been taught to objectify women. These are not horrible people. It's, it's, a, it's a learned behavior. We watch this game, we celebrate this day, and companies make billions of dollars. Yet we do nothing about the seedy underbelly that robs girls of their innocence and self-worth and creates a lousy path for their lives. I am at 18 minutes now, so I'll quickly wrap this up. And I just want to leave you with a few things you can do to become a warrior for social justice. Learn to love yourself. Simple. Takes, you know, a minute a day, seven minutes a week, and learn to love yourself. Do not care about what others think. It pulls you into a trap of conformity. If you have issues at home, don't ignore them. They won't go away. On a local level, walk the walk. Be aware of the content you watch and the messages you are getting. If you buy something, be aware of the company and what they represent. And important, most important, begin to look at the world around you from an anthropological perspective. How do we get to the place we are today? Trace the social issue back historically. So locally, start small. Look closer at the people in your community. I see this uh, man in an electric wheelchair every day going down Portola Valley Road. Stop and say hi to people like that. Let them know you care. And then do something crazy about the brainwashing. If you don't like wearing makeup, collect all your girlfriends, put a bunch of makeup together, and stomp it, rip it, squish it, and throw it out. Um, if you love a cable or television show, watch it. But bring all your friends around to discuss what stereotypes, what images, what conditioning you're getting from those. Once you begin to do these things for yourself and each other, then and only then can we have hope 
for the rest of the world. This is my work, and I invite you to join me. Thank you.